So I think the best way to do this is to play the whole clip and then we'll go through it point by point and statement by statement. So let's go. What's, what, what, do you think, what do you think is the truth? What is truth? What is truth? Um, that's an interesting question, right? Because it shouldn't be, but truth should be, truth is subjective, you know? Because what I believe to be true, well, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the truth is because I think everybody has a belief. So I think we confuse the two. I think, I think people, I think there's truth and then there's beliefs. I think we all have a bunch of beliefs that we, but we think are the truth, but they're not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think we all have just a bunch of different beliefs. So maybe the truth is subjective. The truth got to be subjective in a way, because it's all our beliefs, right? If everybody has various beliefs, if everybody has a bunch of things that they think are true. You know, this this is hard for me because you know this already, but I think I'm always right. We so, know. So I feel like... One, I feel like you're right that it that in some ways it is subjective, but I feel like there are some things that are absolute truth. Tell me something like, you think is true. We are alive. Well, we are alive. Says who? We are breathing. We're breathing. Okay. Are you high right now? No, I'm saying you said you said we said we're alive. I mean I guess we are physically, but some of us are just living. Are we really alive? Okay, so then, so then, then we get into the definition of things is also subjective. Mm -hmm. So we okay. So then, to, let's take a step back. So we are breathing. Yes. Okay, we are blood run through runs through our veins. Yes. Um, we have brains. We have other organs. Yes. We can see. You and I can see, everybody can't see. So but so there are things that are fact that are um, sym synonymous with truth, but I hear the point that you're raising, which is perspective. Some people um, confuse perspective for truth. We confuse our belief <laughs> with truth. Yeah, okay, okay, so, yeah. So, 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 so be your beliefs might not necessarily be the truth. Yeah. And we and we confuse them. We confuse the two often. How much energy do you think we should spend on trying to um, make distinctions between those two things? It depends, right? Um, as long as my beliefs aren't harmful. Mm. If my beliefs, what I believe to be is true, is not harmful, then I guess I don't necessarily have to search for the actual truth. But if your beliefs are harmful and your beliefs are hurting people, you might want to, you know, go go get a second opinion on that belief and try to find some real hard truth. You know what I mean? I think self. I think I think this. I think the work you do on yourself is um a harsh dose of truth. Like that inner work, that inner work you do on yourself. Ooh, yeah. That inner work you do on yourself is a harsh dose of truth. You know, when you're sitting in that therapist's yeah. office and or that psychiatrist's office, are you sitting with your safety purpose coach and it's just you and that individual and you feel safe enough to have those uh, inner conversations that you have when you're alone. Now, as we get into this, even though they did not specifically make their discussion about the truth of Christianity in general, I think there's some helpful takeaways from how we come to understand truth and specifically truth as it pertains to Christianity. I need to lay some groundwork in order for us to accurately assess this dialogue. See, the question has to be raised and answered as to whether one can determine truth. Is truth knowable in the first place? Objective truth. If so, what are the rules that undergird the philosophically sound process of arriving at truth. Let's begin with a brief understanding of epistemology and ontology. Ontology focuses on the nature of existence itself, the general features that are true of all things whatsoever, as well as classifying or grouping things that exist in various ways ranging from the specific 
to very broad types of classification. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. So epistemology is the branch of philosophy that tries to make sense out of knowledge, rationality, and justified or unjustified beliefs. The term epistemology comes from the Greek word episteme, which means knowledge. Now, some are skeptical as to what one can objectively know. One may believe that humans cannot objectively access knowledge about the universe, its origins, or the creation of the human species. Other philosophers and scientists feel completely justified in the knowledge they obtain and the means by which they obtain it. Not all truths are established truths. Now, if you flip a coin and never check how it landed, it may be true that it landed on heads, even if nobody has any way to tell. Truth is a metaphysical as opposed to epistemological notion. Truth is a matter of how things are, not how they can be shown to be. So when we say that only true things can be known, we're not yet saying anything about how anyone can access the truth. But there is objective truth. It is true that the universe is at least 40 years old, because I am. It is true that gravity exists. It is true that one plus one equals two. In fact, math is the only discipline where we can always speak of objective truths, where no opinion can determine what is or isn't fact. Belief, you can believe something that is not necessarily true. The general idea behind the belief condition is that you can only know what you believe. Failing to believe something precludes knowing it. Belief in the context of the justified true belief theory means full belief or outright belief. Justified. Let's talk about this. So why can't we just say that if something is true and or if one believes something to be true, that that is enough to determine that said thing is in fact true? Because one can believe something to be true even if it isn't, and or something can be true, even if no one believes it. For most of the history of the people on, on earth, people believed the earth was flat. That didn't make it true, and that doesn't make it true. Also, a belief might be true, even if it is formed improper properly. So therefore, one must be justified in determining what, in fact, is true. And that is a philosophical standard that we and all, Charlemagne and Angela included, need to adhere to. Now, off the bat, we have to understand that there are multiple ways of achieving or arriving at justification. An internalist might say that justification will be determined based upon the internal access of the individual to assess the truth of a statement or situation. An externalist, as you might imagine, would say that the factors or evidences external to or outside of the individual are the primary method for determining what is a justified true belief. Now, it's worth noting that one might distinguish between two importantly different notions of justification, standardly referred to as propositional justification and doxastic justification, sometimes ex ante justification and ex post justification, respectively. Unlike that, between internalist and externalist approaches to justification, the distinction between propositional and doxastic justification does not represent a conflict to be resolved. It is a distinction between two distinct properties that are called justification. Propositional justification concerns whether a subject has sufficient reason to believe a given proposition. Doxastic justification concerns whether a given belief is held appropriately. One common way of relating the two is to suggest that propositional justification is the more fundamental or basic and that doxastic justification is a matter of a subject's having a belief 
that is appropriately responsive to or based on their propositional justification. Quick side note, Christianity covers both. We have the internal witness of the Holy Spirit and the external evidences of history, archaeology, science, and philosophy. So let's break this down clip by clip. What's, what, what, do you think, what do you think is the truth? What is truth? What is truth? Um, that's an interesting question, right? What is truth? So Alvin Plantinga has said philosophy is just thinking hard about something. And this means we need a method for how to think correctly. Now, in philosophy, you put forth arguments. It doesn't mean you're arguing. It just means you're putting forth propositions. You're putting forth statements that can be tested. Moreland and Craig wrote an argument in the philosophical sense is a set of statements that serve as premises leading to a conclusion. Now, here's what people need to understand on a basic level. An argument, and I'll talk more about this as we go, in philosophy is not yelling at someone to get your point across. It is presenting a set of propositions that you believe entail a certain conclusion. It can be said that the conclusion obtained or is obtained. Now, I'm not going to go deep into explaining the, the antecedent and the consequent, which are the logical components of a syllogism which is an argument that uses deductive reasoning to arrive at the conclusion. But what we need to say for our purposes right now is that there are rules to this. When the deal goes down, uh, all of this talk about uh, rules, we make them up as we go along. There's rules to this. We don't get to just make up how we do this thinking thing. And if you don't know the rules, don't engage in the discussion publicly because it shouldn't be but truth should be truth is subjective you know because what i believe to be true so he said truth is subjective if it is a true statement that truth itself is subjective then we have to apply that truth to this statement as well so if the statement truth is subjective is true then the statement is false because if it is an objectively true truth, that truth is subjective, then that statement is untrue, which makes it self-refuting. An argument that is both logically valid and has true premises is called a sound argument. An unsound argument is either invalid or else has a false premise. Now, there are formal and informal fallacies. Very briefly, a formal fallacy results in reasoning that becomes invalid by a flaw in its logical structure that can be neatly expressed in a standard logical statement, for example, propositional logic. So self-refuting statements are, are logical fallacies. Informal fallacy is having insufficient or irrelevant or ambiguous evidence which falls or fails rather to warrant the conclusion judging this this can take on a degree of subjectivity that never enters into the evaluation of deductive arguments resulting from an improper inductive argument. Now, this could be one of several informal fallacies that is being committed here. One is amphiboly. So this is the fallacy of formulating our premises in such a way that their meaning is ambiguous. So I don't know what you're talking about. Now, the most common Informal fallacy is petitio principia, begging the question. The conclusion of one's argument is taken as one of the premises somewhere in the argument. So you use your argument to make your argument and ultimately supporting your argument with the premises within your argument. And that's why they call it circular reasoning. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know what the truth is because I think everybody has a belief. I think we confuse the two. I think, I think people, I think there's truth. And then there's beliefs. I think we all have a bunch of beliefs that we but we think are the truth, but they're not. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? I think we all have just a bunch of different beliefs. So maybe the truth is subjective. The truth got to be subjective in a way, because it's all our beliefs, right? If everybody has various beliefs, if everybody has a bunch of things that they think are true. So this is an interesting discussion of truth 
versus beliefs. Let's talk about warrant. Warrant is a justified true belief. Now, Alvin Plantinga said that in philosophy, knowledge is warranted true belief. And a belief has warrant for some person, if and only if, that belief was formed by cognitive faculties that are functioning properly and in accordance with a good design plan and a cognitive environment appropriate for the way those faculties were designed and when the design plan for our faculties is aimed at obtaining truth. Okay. Are you high right now? So you have to be functioning in your right mind for the for the belief that you come to to have warrant. That's a prerequisite. Global skepticism is the view that there is no knowledge or justified belief in any area of human thought. We can't know anything for certain. Additionally, unmitigated skepticism is rooted in a certainty about the uncertainty of our ability to ascertain claims about knowledge in general. Such skeptical views align well with first order skepticism, which is directed at people's general beliefs about the external world. The idea is that we should remain skeptical about every belief, including the, the ones that seem fairly obvious to be true. The degree of these skeptical positions seems to be stretching the usefulness of skepticism to absurdity. For instance, a global unmitigated skeptic might assert that there is no knowledge or justified belief that we can hold with certainty in science, mathematics, or philosophy. However, to hold that position actually requires such a person to hold a philosophical position that there is no cause for certainty. So in spite of the fact that it undermines their position, one sometimes still hold that position. In essence, this level of skepticism becomes self-refuting. The strongest argument in favor of skepticism is heuristic or methodological skepticism. So Craig and more than right here, knowledge and justified belief are acknowledged and skepticism, especially the question, how does one know that X? And the use of doubt is taken as a guiding principle to aid people in their search for a better understanding of epistemological issues. So in this sense, skepticism is not a position to be refuted or rebutted, but a guiding method to help people understand knowledge. In other words, it's good to be skeptical if it's leading you to research further. So this approach, if utilized properly, can enable the researcher or philosopher to have the appropriate level of skepticism that will subvert their presuppositions or inherent biases, which will allow them to discover truths that they may have missed. Now, it's impossible for human beings to have unlimited knowledge, but we clearly do have some knowledge, most of us. If we didn't, we wouldn't be able to communicate, drive, read, write, or live on a day-to-day -day basis. To emphasize an unmitigated global level of skepticism as a way of life would seem to be unlivable. There are limits to what we know or can know, and I think it's crucially important to remember in apologetics so that we are not overstating our case. That being said, if the evidence, whether it's scientific, historical, archaeological, or a certain proposition being justified and true, then we are well within our rights to place our belief in that proposition. Therefore, when I am confronted by a skeptic, I try to ask questions to see what foundational propositions they're comfortable asserting as true and justified. Now, if they seem to be open to accepting the facts that scholars are united on as, as general knowledge, then I would graciously bring up other agreed upon facts that help build the case for a Christian worldview. At the very least, this process will open the skeptic up to the idea that they haven't considered every lane of evidence. And the questions I ask may open them up to evaluating their own assumptions. I feel like there are some things that are absolute truths. Tell me something like, you think is true. We are alive. Well, we are alive. Says who? We are breathing. We're breathing. Okay. 
are you high right now? No, I'm saying you said you said we said we're alive. I mean, I guess we are physically, but some of us are just living. Are we really alive? Okay, so then, so then, then we get into the definition of things. Is <sighs> some things are absolutely true. Now, Angela makes an important point here, and she's not the first to make it. Uh, when she says that I know that I'm alive or I know that 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 I, that I exist, we are alive. In fact, Descartes had this same epiphany some centuries ago. Stranded during a storm, Descartes was in a room and he began to ponder what he could know for certain. His ultimate revelation was that he can be absolutely certain of his own existence. And at this point, he penned the now infamous words, I think Therefore, I am. See, skepticism is thereby defeated, according to Descartes. No matter how many skeptical challenges are raised. Indeed, even if things are much worse than the most extravagant skeptic ever claimed, there is at least one fragment of genuine human knowledge, my perfect certainty of my own existence. And with regards to Descartes, I believe his take on skepticism was in order to provide validity for Christianity in another way. Craig and Moreland write, Descartes went on from the cogito to reaffirm knowledge of God, logic and mathematics and the external world. In other words, this basic understanding led him to further deepen his understanding of all of the world. I think his alignment with methodological doubt may have gone too far. Perhaps it was the mathematician in him Nevertheless, I don't believe absolute certainty, otherwise known as Cartesian certainty, should be our standard when it comes to the evidential value of claims in favor of God's existence. I believe a more modest form of skepticism is in order if we're going to make a cogent case for Christianity, regardless of what one thinks about. What do we know? Mm -hmm. So we, okay, so then to, let's take a step back. So we are breathing? Yes. Okay. We are, blood run through, runs through our veins. Yes. Um, we have brains. What do we know for sure? It's not that the definitions are subjective. You're conflating an epistemological concern with an ontological concern. You're discussing a metaphysical notion and mixing it in with a physical reality. We have brains, but there's a difference between your brain and your mind. One is natural, one is physical, one is metaphysical, and one is not natural. See, naturalism cannot support this notion of a mind, even though the naturalists who support naturalism have to use their minds in order to deny their existence. They aren't necessarily making this statement in this clip, but I just wanted to point this out to you. But I hear the point that you're raising, which is perspective. Some people um, confuse perspective for truth. We confuse our belief <laughs> with truth. Yeah, okay. Okay, so, yeah. So, 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 so be your beliefs might not necessarily be the truth. There are some things that are facts. The statements made, we confuse our beliefs with truth. Sometimes, but it depends on how you come to hold a certain belief. Now, to be clear, there are some subjective opinions and beliefs that all of us have, but that's not the same as saying that objective truth doesn't exist or that we cannot ascertain objective truth with a high degree of certainty in many different arenas. Additionally, there may be things that are objectively true that we choose not to believe for various reasons, but our disbelief does not remove those things from the category of objectively true. How much energy do you think we should spend on trying to um, make distinctions between those two things? It depends, right? Um, as long as my beliefs aren't harmful. Mm. If my beliefs, what I believe to be is true, is not harmful, then I guess I don't necessarily have to search for the actual truth. But if your beliefs are harmful and your beliefs are hurting people, 
you might want to, you know, go go get a second opinion on that belief and try to find some real hard truth. As long as my beliefs aren't harmful, he says. It's a common thing we hear nowadays. But how do you define harm, which would be a derivative of evil? And if you can't define or ground good. See, once you posit terms such as harm or evil, you have inadvertently posited the idea of good, objective good. But in order for good to remain objective, it must transcend or supersede those who seek to align with it, namely humans. In order for that to be true, a moral law must exist, but that requires a moral law giver. Only God fits that description. Otherwise, concepts such as harmful beliefs exist in this nebulous land of nothingness. That is to say, you have your feet firmly planted in midair. If I'm not harming anyone, then I don't need to search for the tr actual truth, he says. Well, we don't search for truth just when it's convenient. We search for truth because that's the best place to root our lives. Everything we do should and how we leave should how we live should be grounded in truth, the truth, period. Also, there's this idea that somehow truth is always comfortable or convenient, but truth and love should never be divorced from each other. To love someone is to give them the truth, even if it's difficult for them to receive. Now, only Jesus demonstrated how to perfectly offer truth, love, grace, justice, and mercy, never sacrificing one at the expense of any of the others. Now, although that is and should be our goal, we do it imperfectly, thinking that by offering love, we, we can't give all truth, or by offering truth, we're not being loving. But the model exists and the standard remains. You know what I mean? I think self, I think, I think, this, I think the work you do on yourself is um, a harsh dose of truth. Like that inner work, that inner work you do on yourself. Ooh, yeah. Nauseous, I'm physically nauseous. <laughs> so this idea that inner work can lead to truth, and this is a very common and dangerous postmodern methodology for arriving at truth. Because if I have to look within myself, and I'm already not perfect, I might come away with an imperfect definition or realization or belief about something to be true. However, you can never be the locus in the search for truth. If I have a compass and that compass is supposed to point due north, then I know if I need to go east to get where I'm going, I know which way to go. But what if that arrow on the compass points at you? And now you're trying to go east, but every time you turn around, the compass keeps pointing at you. How helpful will that compass be? Not very. Because when we become the arbiters of truth and there is no external point of reference, it's a dangerous way for a society to function. Now, let me be clear. The issue isn't you having an opinion. It's you having a platform and not being aware that those who watch you may not be able to distinguish between truth and your opinion. I have whole degrees in reading and studying these matters. I've learned from people with many more degrees than me who have been engaging these topics for their entire careers. And this isn't to say that having a degree makes one the arbiter of truth. That's not the point here. It is to say that studying truth and the nature thereof allows one to see how vital it is to be accurate on this topic, as well as how nuanced some ancillary topics to objective truth can become. Everyone has the right to his or her opinion, but everyone also has a responsibility to steward his or her platform well. And if need be, bow out of the conversation. If the conversation is over your head or out of your realm of understanding, gracefully bow out. Peace.